In the United States, the conflict between Israel and its neighbors, and particularly between Israelis and the Palestinians, has been described variously as a clash between Jews and Muslims, Arab nations and a beleaguered Jewish state, democracy and feudalism, the East and the West. Yet a few popular histories have placed the roots of this bloody and seemingly intractable conflict within the grand political matrix that has shaped the region's history. A history which is embedded in the narrative of Western Empire and global imperialism. Through the late 19th century, European elites and their subjects widely regarded what they called the Orient, everything east of Greece and Turkey, as a strange, mysterious place imbued with the West's preconceived notions of the region's culture, politics, and race. This was the age of European colonialism, and by the beginning of the 20th century, European governments effectively controlled 85% of the globe's peoples and resources. But nationalism was rising across the world, and European imperialism would soon clash with the awakening nationalism of the Arabic people. So the, the Arab nationalism, I would say, in the first instance, is a coming to consciousness of the unity of the Arab peoples, which all through this period in the late 19th century uh, and into the early 20th century is reacting against uh, one or another type of foreign intervention. And second, Part of it is a tremendous movement of Islamic reform, where the sense that the world is a dynamic place, partly realized through colonialism. The world is a dy dynamic place. Europe is on the move, on the march. And the, and the Islamic world seems to be, by comparison, backward. And the third part of it is, you might say, cultural and religious, a sense of an attempt to restore the previous uh, glory of an earlier age. At the beginning of the 20th century, the rising consciousness of Arab nationalism comes into conflict with another ideology of equal passion, Zionism. Zionism is born out of the European Jewish experience, including the violent pogroms and virulent anti-Semitism that permeated 19th century Europe. By the late 1800s, Zionism's early theoreticians and leading advocates including Theodor Herzl, widely regarded as the founder of national Zionism, increasingly characterized Jewish persecution as a condition of their people's statelessness in the age of nation building and empire. Zionism's ultimate answer? The establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the geographical nexus of the Jewish faith. Well, the origin of the world Zionist movement started in 1897 when there was a conference in Basel, Switzerland. Theodor um, Herzl, a Viennese, very much assimilated Jewish uh, journalist, uh, was the head of the World Zionist Movement. And in his diaries, he said that once we create a Jewish state, we will have the native indigenous population uh, clean out the swamps. I guess they were, he assumed there were swamps with snakes, wherever this would be. Didn't, he didn't necessarily focus on Palestine. At one point, he focused on East Africa for a Jewish homeland. And then we will spirit the uh, indigenous population out of the country and deny them work in the country and force them out. In other words, exiling them, uh, you know, expelling them. Well, I'd say there are two aspects of Zionism. Uh, there's Zionism for Jews and there's Zionism for Palestinians and Arabs. For Jews, Zionism is a, is a, is a movement that brought an, a lot of uh, European and uh, Eastern Jews to Palestine, uh, appeared to be promising them a different, and in fact delivered a different life for them, those who had suffered the ravages of anti-Semitism and dispersion, and restored to them an ancient homeland, which none of them had ever, or most of them I should say, had never actually experienced. Now for Palestinians, I'd say everything about that could be true, what I just said about it for Jews is true. But it was, in many instances, at the expense of the Palestinians. Their land, in which the Zionist dream was enacted, 
was lost to them. Their society, which existed before as a mixed society, was shattered. Their presence was no longer desired. Many of them were killed and continue to be persecuted. So it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story of a kind of a Jekyll and Hyde situation where, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Dr. Jekyll uh, is the history of Zionism from the point of view of, uh, of the Jews. And the Hyde side of it is the uh, history of Zionism from the point of view of the Palestinians. In 1908, the Young Turks' rebellion against the old Ottoman regime succeeded in compelling the empire's leadership to accept constitutional rule. With the outbreak of the First World War, the Young Turks opted to side with the nation they considered strongest in the conflict, Germany, in a disastrous misinterpretation of military might. Britain countered by turning to the Arab peoples of the Middle East, including Palestine, promising independence for the Arabs if they would only help the Allies. The promise was very simple, that the British would enable the Arab nation to gain independence. Precisely the word independence was used as a reward for their participation in the, uh, in the British attempt to defeat the Axis powers uh, in World War uh, I, um, predominantly uh, in the battle to unseat the Ottoman uh, Empire. But they also had in mind uh, that that area was very important. They knew that oil had already been discovered in parts of that part of the world, already in Iraq. Uh, oil was discovered uh, around 1911. Already by 1908 or 9, oil in uh, Abadan and Iran was discovered. And there was this important strategic uh, point uh, on the route to India, the prized possession for the British Empire. All of those things uh, uh, come in uh, the context of British motivations. From the Arab standpoint, their motivation was simple. At last, the day has come for independence for the termination of 500 years of Ottoman rule and other forms of colonial interventions in the area. At the beginning of the 20th century, Arabs in Palestine outnumbered Jews, both those native to the region and those more recently arrived by about 10 to 1. The budding discontent within the Ottoman Empire provided the Zionist movement in both Europe and on the ground in Palestine with its first real choice. Should they work with the Arabs against the Turks and join the upcoming revolt against the Ottoman rule? Or should they try to acquire an international charter for a Jewish homeland? After much discussion, most Zionists agree to side with the Turks, although a small minority advocated working with the Arabs in their fight to establish autonomy for the Arab homeland. British government sympathies lean towards the Zionists, however in no small part out of British economic and political self-interest. After persistent lobbying from Lord Rockschild, Lord Balfour indicates that he is ready to grant the Zionists a homeland for the Jews. Already in 1917, the Balfour Declaration is also introduced into the equation. And that declaration uh, promises Her Majesty's government views would favor the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. That's precisely the wording that comes out of it. But Lord Balfour's promise of independence for the Arabs starkly contradicted two other key British pledges. The Balfour's declaration avowed support for a homeland for the Jews and an agreement with France to carve up authority and power in the Middle East between two imperial players, France and Britain. Ramsay MacDonald, future head of the first Labour government in Britain, saw this quite clearly and, after a visit to Palestine, commented, In Palestine, I learned that during the war, our government authorized the previous High Commissioner to advise the Arabs that we would establish an Arab state on the condition that they would support us in the war. At the same time, we promised to give Palestine to the Jews as their national homeland and to facilitate Jewish immigration in every possible way until the Jews are a majority in Palestine. And at the same time, we made an agreement with a third party, namely France, according to which England and France were to have divided Syria, Palestine, and Iraq between them. Thus, we have assumed three obligations, each of which contradicts the other. The reason was that Britain had already decided in 1917 uh, that it was going to support Jewish nationalism, Zionism. So it issued the Balfour Declaration, and it made sure that the terms of the mandate for Palestine were written so as to give the Balfour Declaration pride of place. In other words, it was, it was featured 
In fact, the terms of the Balfour Declaration are repeated in the mandate for Palestine. So there's the idea of a Jewish national home, the idea of the Jews having national rights, um, the idea that the British are supposed to set up a Jewish agency, which is supposed to be an international body that would represent this population. All these things are set out in the terms of the mandate. The Arabs and the Palestinians, the, Arab, the, Ar the word Arab, the word Palestinian, is never mentioned in the mandate. So they don't exist. They're just, they're there, but they have no, no, uh, they're not entitled to anything. Their civil and religious rights are supposed to be protected. That's the only mention. And they're only mentioned as the non-Jewish population. So basically, um, the Arabs were, as it were, uh, eliminated from the very terms of reference for the mandate at, at the very beginning of Britain's uh, rule over, over Palestine. The Treaty of Versailles ratified the tacit agreements France and Great Britain had made to divide up the Middle East and create a series of client states under the domination of these two world powers. The states, especially in the Arab East, uh, took shape really after 1920. Let me give you examples. Lebanon is formed as a state as we know it today in September of 1920. Prior to that date, the current Lebanese state did not exist. There was a Mount Lebanon, which was a province within the Ottoman uh, Empire. But today's Lebanon, with the south added to it, taken out of greater Syria, did not exist prior to September of 1920. Syria uh, was taken over by the uh, French, uh, uh, pulled together and divided up uh, by, the, by the French in four regions. Uh, as part of a divide and rule scheme for regions uh, along religious lines in order to maintain a form of decentralized state in order to enable French uh, dominance uh, to persist. Jordan is created. There was no such thing as Jordan. Jordan is created also in 1920-21. In fact, the army, the Jordanian army was created one year before the establishment of Jordan as a state. And as you look in the Churchill papers, uh, and as you look into the whole correspondence around that time, the importance of Jordan and the creation of Jordan as an entity was to enable the British to maintain their policy in Palestine. Again, divide and rule uh, is, an, is the operative uh, framework for that time. Self-determination is meant for people who deserve it, people who are civilized enough to deserve it and also white enough to deserve it. People who are nice, white, civilized folks like us in business-run societies who understand the need to, uh, to subordinate oneself to the goals of the dominant business community, those people can have self-determination. But people who are uncivilized and don't understand their values, self-determination is not supposed to work for them. Uh, so they are supposed to perform the third world service function. Uh, now, they can have a pretense of self-determination. So, for example, as, well, Middle East after the First World War was largely a British preserve, so they were the ones doing most of the planning. But as uh, Lord Curzon put it, what you, what you it's, it said it's a bad idea to directly control the colonies. You know, that's just inefficient and stirs up problems. Uh, we should have what he called indirect control, meaning Britain should rule through, his word was, an Arab facade. Uh, the, you, uh, uh, the phrase was something like this. So he said, absorption as a colony should be veiled uh, behind fictions such as buffer state or sphere of influence and so on. In the wake of the Treaty of Versailles, de facto division of the Arab homeland into parcels of land under the dominant purview of Western nations, Palestine falls to the control of the British who view it as an important link in their empire. Land sales by the Jewish National Fund, the Jewish land purchasing agent of the Zionist movement, rise significantly after the First World War. Palestinian opposition to Zionist settlers begins in earnest in the early 20th century, as tenant farmers become increasingly alarmed at the likely prospect that these absentee land sales will force their removal from communal lands which many villagers have farmed for generations. The escalating rate of land sales by absentee owners in the post-war years heightens a growing sense of disenfranchisement among Palestine's Arab population and soon brings unrest. The newspapers, the writers, 
organized. There were many newspapers who wrote again and warned of the Zionist danger to the Arab homeland. Uh, that opinion was raised, and then it took in the form of communal fighting as well between Arabs and Jews. Because in essence, what the Arabs were saying is, we don't mind having uh, Jews live with us as a community, but we do mind the establishment of a Jewish home, because to us that means that we will be reduced into a minority in our historical abode. Sporadic fighting between indigenous Palestinians and Jewish settlers grew throughout the 1920s. Tensions escalated with the Great Depression and the arrival of new waves of Zionist-sponsored immigrants into Palestine. Finally, in 1936, Palestinian grievances against both the British and the Zionist settlers broke to a boil and rapidly escalated into a full-scale revolt. There was a three-year, uh, not only just civil war, it's the longest-lasting labor strike that uh, uh, existed in that part of the world uh, in our recorded history. There was a strike against the British. There was also a strike against the, uh, 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 the surge of Zionist activity. And uh, the Zionists had already established themselves for, to be an ascendant political force. Uh, after the Palestinian leadership was defeated, some of their leaders were expelled uh, to uh, places as far as the seashells by the British as punitive measures for their participation in the 1936-39 uprising. I remember that my father uh, had a very slight limb. Mm. Uh, when, when I was a young child, I would be looking at his leg and ask, what, what, what's wrong with your leg? And he, would, he showed me his ankle, and uh, there was uh, a hole in his ankle. And he said, this is a bullet that I received in the 1936 um, uh, disturbances in Palestine. It was a sharpener, not a bullet. It was a sharpener that he suffered all his life from. The British basically arrested or exiled the entire Arab leadership, except for a few individuals who collaborated with the British. Uh, virtually every s important leader of the Palestinians was either killed or executed, killed in combat or executed, or in, in the case of the senior political leaders, exiled to the seashells. My uncle was one of them. Um, for several, many years, or forced to flee, like the Mufti. He ends up in Germany during the war. Um, therefore, after the war, after World War II, some of these people were allowed to return from exile, some of these people were released from prison, the ones who were dead obviously were dead. Um, but some of them, like the Mufti, were never able to come back. The British government's formal response to the 1936 uprising came in the form of the appointment of a royal commission headed by Earl Peel to investigate the situation. And the commission entertained the idea of formally partitioning Palestine into Jewish and Arab sections. The Peel Commission envisioned a small Jewish state, one that included the Galilee, the Jezreel Valley, and the coastal plain that runs from Acre to Tel Aviv. All the rest of historic Palestine, except Jerusalem, which would be ruled under the terms of a British mandate, were to be included in the Arab state. The commission also proposed a formal separation of the population, as well as Jewish and British financial support for the new Arab government. It was also suggested that the state would merge with Transjordan under the leadership of Amir Abdallah. The Arab High Commission rejected the plan and soon David Ben-Gurion expressed his reservations as well, proposing that the Zionists should hold out for a better deal. But Joseph Weitz, director of the Jewish Land Fund, knew that after the war the problem would reach a crisis. He wrote in his diaries, After the Second World War, the question of the land of Israel and the questions of the Jews would be raised beyond the framework of development amongst ourselves. It must be clear that there is no room for both peoples in this country. If the Arabs leave the country, it will be broad and wide open for us. And if the Arabs stay, the country will remain narrow and miserable. And there is no way besides transferring the Arabs from here to the neighboring countries to transfer them all, except maybe from Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Old Jerusalem. We must leave not a single village, not a single tribe. There is no other way out. But from 1937, when the first British partition plan was put forward, which would have given, uh, the, created a small Jewish state and a large Arab area, which would have been annexed to Jordan, 
um, King Abdullah, Amir, then Amir Abdullah, was intent on expanding his uh, 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 area of influence into Palestine. And this was something that was welcome to both the British and to the Zionists, um, because he was he intended on doing so at the expense of the Palestinians, uh, and in, in place of their national movement and in place of their aspirations for independence. During World War II, the Allied nations, including the United States, steadfastly refused to open their borders to Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazi Holocaust, despite solid intelligence indicating the extent of the Axis genocide against the Jews. But news of the extent of the genocide spread rapidly at the close of the war, and newsreel footage and survivors' accounts brought the horror of the carnage of the final solution home to the world. Sympathy and a nascent, if inarticulate, desire to atone for European and American indifference to the Jews' plight during the dark years of the Third Reich grew. Now, it's part of the pr problem, I think, that in dealing with Israel, that a lot of people in the West have, obviously, the, the guilty feeling that the, these are Jews, after all, who suffered the horrors of what went on in, in World War II and the Holocaust, which is, you know, a, a, a terrible, uh, unparalleled ex uh, experience for a race or, p or people to suffer. After World War II, and World War II was about uh, uh, Germany's effort to annex and conquer territory by force, to, to create a, a, a German fatherland. After that, the rules were rewritten, and we have something called the United Nations Charter. We have something called the Geneva Conventions. And one of the fundamental principles of the international order uh, coming out of World War II is the uh, enshrining the principle of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force. But it doesn't make it any the less easy for Palestinians, who, while obviously are not suffering a Holocaust, are suffering, whether we talk about the demolition of houses, curfews of the entire population, every form of collective punishment forbidden by the Geneva Convention, uh, mass imprisonment without, uh, without trial, hu humiliation by being beaten up, having to carry special cards, discriminations made against Palestinians by virtue of their national origin and religion, etc. Starting in late 1947, after the UN decided to partition the country, a fighting broke out and there began s systematic expulsion of Palestinians. And particularly in areas uh, where Jews wanted to create a, a state. The end result was that uh, of the uh, more than uh, one million Palestinians, approximately uh, somewhere between 700 and 800,000 were expelled from their homes. More than uh, 500 towns and villages were uh, depopulated or destroyed and these people became refugees. On April 19, 1947, the Israelis Irgun and LH-1 units attacked the Arab village of Deir Yassin. 250 Palestinians were killed. Most of those killed were non-combatants. There were also cases of mutilation and rape. Word of the massacre spread quickly, and while officially condemned by Jewish authorities, Irgun commander and future Israeli premier Menachem Begin stated, we created terror among the Arabs and all the villages around. In one blow, we changed the strategic situation. The legend of Dir Yassin spread panic among thousands of Palestinians. The experience of Palestinians and the knowledge of, of the Palestinian people from their experiences always that they had been systematically terrorized into leaving their homes. There were massacres, there were forced marches, in w on which many people died. As we saw recently in, uh, in Kosovo, where uh, a few massacres were enough to, to terrify people in, into leaving. Well, I mean, if you want to talk about myths and fallacies and ignorance and a curtain of uh, misinformation, what happened in 1947-48 is probably one of the most important periods where people really don't know what happened. One of the key things to remember is that the fighting started long before May 15th, when the State of Israel was established and several Arab armies entered the country. Um, it started, in fact, the moment that partition was announced in November 1947. 
And it was essentially a war of positions with ambushes and terrorism for many, many months. But in the spring of 1948, the, the Yeshua, the Jewish community in Palestine, and the Zionist movement, was able to mobilize its forces and win a sort of rolling series of crushing victories. The wholesale clearances of the Arab populations was the result of a well-planned Zionist operation called Plan D. Plan D was conceived to create fear and terror, and it succeeded. Anybody who has the capacity to leave a war zone is likely to think of their children, their personal safety, and leave. If you have a strong state that can force you to stay, or that can organize things to defend you, you're less likely to leave. But that, that wasn't the case for the Palestinians, for a variety of reasons. They didn't have a state. They didn't have even a Paris state. And as a result, a lot of people fled just out of fear. Um, the fact is, the Arabs left not because their leaders told them to, not because of some diabolical plan, but essentially because they were driven out or because uh, their, their homes became unsafe. The success of Plan D ended the first stage of the war. Arab states surrounding Palestine were divided over what to do. Many were reluctant to intervene. Egypt acted only in the last minutes of the war. Iraq sent token forces, and other states had no armies capable of intervening. Jordan had long sought the West Bank. Sensing an opportunity, Jordan's King Abdullah positioned his forces in areas which Jordan hoped to annex. All of the Jordanian army and the Iraqi army were doing was carving out for Jordan a piece of the West Bank, more or less by agreement with the Jewish agency. How big that piece would be, nobody had agreed. And that's what the fighting was about. Um, while there was fierce fighting between the Jordanian army and the Israelis, in fact, there was at the same time a, a high degree of collusion as to some objectives. Much has been made of the David versus Goliath struggle for Israel in 1948. History contradicts the legend. The combined forces of the Arab states and the Arab League totaled about 21,000 men. Israeli forces numbered about 65,000 men. On June 11, 1948, the Security Council of the United Nations succeeded in bringing about a truce. The Israeli army remained on the offensive, and the shooting truce lasted until the Armistice Agreement of 1949. During the truce, Israel increased its territory by a third, beyond what had been granted under the United Nations plan. So that what happened to us in 1948 was not only the destruction of the society, but in the case of my family, my, both my mother's family and my father's family on both sides, every single member of my family was, a refu was made a refugee in 1948. We were all, not a single member of my family remained in Palestine past the late spring of 1948. And this is a story repeated over and over again. The Israeli myth has always been that there were no expulsions that Israel is not responsible, that uh, there were no massacres, that whatever happened, happened as a result of war and fighting, and in war people die, and, and that's tragic. Uh, and has been to deny this completely. Uh, and moreover, to say that the Palestinians left their homes because they were ordered to by their leaders and by Arab states. This was Israel's position for a very long time, and you can still see those things asserted in the mainstream media in the United States. Israel increased its territory during the war. Jordan annexed what remained of Palestine. Palestinians had been driven from their homes and forced into refugee camps, where many would live for the next 50 years. The Arab states, poor and ill-equipped, could not afford the influx of refugees. Israel immediately began to eradicate signs of Arab life. Olive trees were uprooted, houses bulldozed, and those who had fled were permanently barred. 120,000 Arabs remained in Israel, but they posed a problem. Not just unpopular, they were considered security risks. We went to visit um, the Galilee in Nazareth, which is the, the area inside of Israel which has the most Palestinians, basically. It's a high um, percentage of Palestinians who still live there and who are Israeli citizens, who have citizenship rights as Israelis. But at the same time, because they're not Jewish, and because how the law has been constructed in Israel to favor Jews, to favor military service, that they don't have as much access to the rights to get these cheap houses in the settlement, to have the rights to build their house, or the rights to move to another area. 
you're also not able to go to the same schools. You're not able, it's a sort of a Jim Crow-like segregation. So that, this is the type of racism they, they sort of face on a daily level. It's not just a separation, but it's more of an act of trying to oppress this community that's within the state of Israel. Sporadic fighting continued between Arabs and Jews after 1950. Ariel Sharon began his career as a young Israeli commander in charge of new settlements, where his troops raided an Arab village and 60 villagers died. I was brought up as a, in a conservative congregation on Long Island, so I came up in a pretty standard, I think, middle-class Jewish environment. We weren't too religious. In fact, we weren't terribly religious, but we followed the tradition of, of being Jews. So I've, I've been spending some time in the last couple of months going back and reading, you know, doing some history analysis. And what is most striking to me is that you go back to 1948 and you go to 19, 1950s, the 1967 war and the 1973 war, and they are the same names. Ariel Sharon is a great example. Ariel Sharon in 19, I think it was in the early 1950s, uh, led a group called Unit 101. It was a special commando unit that was established by the Israeli, by the IDF. And they, they, um, there was a, an attack on a village, uh, and I think a hand grenade was thrown into a person's house and a couple of people were killed. And in response, Unit 101 went into this Palestinian village, it was called Kibya, and massacred like 60 people. And it was one of the most blatant, outrageous massacres at the time. They immediately covered it up by saying that it was, it was a bunch of Israelis uh, acting in revenge and retaliation of the killing. But in fact, it was, a, it was a specific action led by Ariel Sharon. And so you have this person who has this really awful history as essentially a murder of Palestinians from the late 1940s all the way up to today. In 1952, Jamal Abdel Nasser overthrew the government of Egypt, deposing King Farouk. The officers' revolt which Nasser led had suddenly created a new type of leader within the Arab world. Oh, I was very proud because this was the first uh, Arab leader who was uh, defying uh, the old uh, imperialist powers and uh, this was the beginning sign of the beginning of uh, true liberation. In 1956, Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Israel allied herself with France and Britain and invaded Egypt. Britain and France pressured both countries for a ceasefire and then invaded Egypt. U.S. President Dwight David Eisenhower, furious at the action, demanded and got a ceasefire. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. In the circumstances I have described, there will be no United States involvement in these present hostilities. I therefore have no plan to call the Congress in special session. Of course, we shall continue to keep in contact with congressional leaders of both parties. UN peacekeepers now buffered Israel and Egypt, but sniping between the two continued. In Israel, economic development was stimulated by Jews around the world particularly in the United States. Planting a tree for Israel was one of many campaigns promoting the country's economic growth. Well, I work for the city of Cambridge as the director of the Peace Commission, um, and we're a city department that has been very involved for the last 15 years at what are the roots of violence in our own community, what kinds of projects with young people in the schools, and in relationship to other countries, can we be involved with supporting peace? All the Jews in our delegation grew up planting a tree in Israel. And so they got to see what those trees were. I mean, it was this extraordinarily painful realization that what they were doing out of a sense of supporting the livelihood of a people, the Jewish people, was being done at the expense of another people. In 1965 and 66, the Palestinian Liberation Organization and its affiliate, the Palestine Liberation Army, were formed. Both incorporated past Palestinian organizations. Well, the PLO was founded in 1964. Uh, but I, I think that if you look carefully at the early literature of the PLO, you'll note in, for example, the National Charter, which is 64 and then uh, re, uh, redone, or reformulated, or, or, or corrected in 1968. You'll notice that 
There are references to earlier generations of Palestinian national movements who struggle against uh, the occupation of Palestine. Uh, so in that sense, I'd say that the PLO is a, an extension of the Palestinian national movement of the 1930s and then the 40s, which was defeated uh, in 1948, lost the country, and went into exile. Um, and was restored in a, in, a, in, a, in a more important way after 1964, after the defeat of 1967. The War of 1967 began when the United Arab Republics, Egypt and Syria, asked for the withdrawal of UN forces. Israel mobilized, stating that Egypt planned an attack. Jordan, fearful of another war, sought and got insurances from the United States that Israel would not attack it. Jordan was immediately attacked and Israel quickly routed the Arabs in what became known as the Six-Day War. The invasion left Israel in control of Palestine. In 1967, you just had a ceasefire line. So on the, on the Suez Canal was one of the ceasefire lines. Um, Israel had occupied a chunk of southern Syria. This was the Golan Heights. That's where the ceasefire line was. And Israel had uh, occupied the entire West Bank and Gaza Strip and Jerusalem. So. The ceasefire line there was along the Jordan River on the east. So Israel now had reached on the north and the east and the south, and in the case of Syria, gone beyond the international frontiers of pre-1948 Palestine. And in the case of Egypt, had gone into and taken sovereign Egyptian territory, Sinai, as well as the Gaza Strip. Shortly after the June War, the Israeli government, through the Jewish Land Fund and the Israeli Land Administration, began to purchase land within the occupied territories. Land was also acquired through confiscation and what could be termed selective violence. Those fleeing violence found themselves homeless. By decree, the military government seized land and buildings whose owners had fled the country even before the war. As Israel's definition of abandoned property were enlarged and redefined, the confiscations of Arab lands increased. I was born in Amman, Jordan, and uh, uh, the reason why we lived in Amman or where my parents lived in Amman was because in 67, uh, my father was studying outside, and the war broke out, the June 1967 war broke out, and my mother was, uh, had just had my eldest uh, sister, and my father told her, come, you know, I don't want you to be inside that situation within that time. We'll stay in the U.S., we'll stay in Jordan, we'll stay for a couple of years, and then we'll go back, like everybody else thought they would go back. Of course, they could not go back after the end of the June 1967 war. Uh, all of the Palestinians, they were counted, that were inside. They were given ID cards, and everybody that was outside had no claim and could not return. Their problem of refugees is not just that they're living in camps. That's the symptom. The problem is that their human rights, their right to their country, the right to live in their own country, uh, which is in, enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, has been denied to them for 52 years. The, the rights to their personal property, to the land, personal and communal property, the land that they've been farming uh, for generations, for centuries, has been taken away from them. Their houses and so on, their right to a future. How many generations of Palestinian children grew up in camps and lost their future. That is what the problem is. It's not that they're living in camps, because Palestinians who don't live in camps feel the deprivation uh, and the wrong uh, just as strongly. But Israel's hope has always been to get rid of the camps, certainly the ones outside uh, its control, so that the problem would disappear. Israeli control of the West Bank brought Israel and Palestine into direct conflict. The defeat of the Arab nations had left the Palestinians isolated. The PLO now became the spokesman for the displaced Palestinians. So the PLO, in its modern phase, is really has to be understood as a kind of critique of what happened in 1967, the insufficiency of the Arab, you know, the Egyptian and the Syrian and, and others, and Jordanian, uh, efforts. Uh, to, to, to claim back for Palestinians their, 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 their rights, which had been alienated from them. The Israeli government now began to contend that Palestine had never existed. Then Premier of Israel, Golda Meir, stated, there are no Palestinians. 
The United States, under the leadership of Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, had staked future U.S. Middle East policy on an ever tighter relationship with Israel. They were in no position to disagree over Palestine. The PLO continued its fight against Israel. A massive flow of refugees had produced instability in Jordan. Jordan's King Hussein retaliated, driving the PLO out of the Hashemite Kingdom during the now famous days of Black September. The cycles of violence then widened with the attacks by the PPLA. But I think it also helped to, uh, to solidify the Israeli argument that the Palestinians are just a bunch of bloodthirsty, murderous terrorists. Um, Israel has always tried to evade any historic responsibility for evicting the Palestinians, establishing a state on land which is almost entirely owned by Palestinians by uh, portraying any Palestinian reaction to their dispossession as some uh, manifestation of an innate, fanatical, hostile Arab nature. Israeli control of the Sinai now prompted a surprise attack. In 1973, the armies of Egypt and Syria invaded Israel. The Egyptian army advanced rapidly, inflicting heavy casualties, only to see the Israelis rally and surround them. Seeing an Egyptian army on the point of annihilation, the Soviet Union threatened intervention. U.S. President Richard Nixon put American forces on nuclear alert. The gravity of the situation forced a ceasefire, but the myth of Israeli invincibility had been shattered. Egypt and Syria's aim had been to gain control of occupied territories, not establish justice for the Palestinians. The effect on the Palestinians was very important, though. Um, what the 73 war meant was that the Arab states most concerned, Egypt and Syria, had abandoned forever fighting for Palestine per se. The 1973 war was launched to liberate the occupied Egyptian and Syrian territories. There was no pal war aim regarding the Palestinians as far as the Syrians and Egyptians were concerned. They fought it within occupied territory to liberate occupied territory of their own. And as soon as the war was over, they started negotiating on a bilateral basis with Israel about the Golan Heights, as far as the Syrians were concerned, and as far as, far as the Sinai Peninsula, uh, where Egypt was concerned. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter brokered a well-publicized peace treaty agreement between Anwar Sadat of Egypt and the former Irgun terrorist Menachem Begin. The peace accords widely praised throughout the Western world brought Carter international acclaim, but the peace did nothing for the dispossessed Palestinians. They continued to pay lip service to the fact that, of course, we are supporters of the Palestinian cause. But basically, the Palestinians were cut adrift. The Arab world had more or less informed them, uh, gentlemen, ladies, you're on your own. You know, do your deal with Israel. We are not going to fight to liberate uh, Israel, i.e., the parts of Palestine that were taken in 1948. A. B. We all accept Security Council Resolution 242, which accepts the right of all states in the in, the, in all states in the region to live in peace, which meant Egypt and Syria accepted the legitimacy of the state of Israel within its 1967 uh, boundaries. In the early 1980s, civil war erupted in Lebanon between a Muslim majority and the right-wing Christian minority, Falange. Israel, hoping they would attack and destroy the PLO, formed an alliance with the Falange. The campaign, led by General Ariel Sharon, was bitter and violent. The PLO fought the well-equipped Israelis, in the midst of one of the most beautiful cities in the Middle East. Beirut was destroyed. Its name became a synonym for the horrors of war. Israelis began to question the Begin government, whose policies had led to Beirut. The question soon overwhelmed Begin, as General Sharon, using Begin's policies as pretext, set right-wing militias loose in a Palestinian camp. The camp, occupied by men, women, and children, was soon the site of a massive massacre in Sabra and Shatila. The Israeli government maintained its ignorance of acts carried out under the supervision of its own army officers. We came here only for one purpose, and that is to destroy, to destroy, and take, it, take this world to destroy the terrorist PLO Palestinian Organization. Sharon intended there to be a massacre. Sharon sent these forces in to kill women and children. There was nobody else there but civilians. Um, there were no guns in the camps. Uh, there were no forces in the camps. 
Uh, these people had been fighting a civil war with other Lebanese and with the Palestinians from 1975, in which uh, thousands of Palestinians had been massacred only six years earlier in the, when the Tadazata camp fell in 1976. So what they would do and why they were sent in there was known to everybody, Sharon and the military command uh, included. So it was a premeditated massacre. And this caused the largest demonstration in Israeli history. A million Israelis marched in protest against these massacres. It caused uh, shock and horror all over the Arab world, obviously. Israel's 1982 invasion of southern Lebanon, including Israel's logistical support for the Lebanese Falange massacres of Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila, marked a turning point in the character of Israeli repression of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. That repression included the Israeli government's renewed commitment to its settler colonial roots and an increasingly intensified program of settlement expansion in the occupied territories. This period of military occupation became increasingly marked by sweeping human rights abuses, detentions, demolitions, and land confiscation. In December of 1987, following an incident in Gaza, Palestinians struck back at Israeli occupation, and the first Intifada was born. The revolt soon evolved into a full-scale popular uprising. America TV audiences were deluged with images of young, rock-throwing Palestinians engaging Israeli soldiers in tanks in running street battles. The root causes of the Intifada were seldom explored. And when people see Palestinians uh, throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers or firing at Israeli settlers, they're unaware of the fact that these settlers are living on land confiscated from the Palestinians in violation of international law and numerous UN resolutions. A Palestinian once told a uh, American journalist that the Palestinians had lived under the Ottoman Turks and then they lived under the British and later they lived under the Jordanians and then finally the Jordanians had been replaced in the West Bank by Israel and of course in the Gaza Strip the Palestinians had lived under the Ottomans, the British, then the Egyptians and then the Israelis. And he said that in the case of the Ottomans, the British, and the Jordanians, they taxed us and they didn't give us a vote. Uh, taxation without representation, if you will. But, he said, the Israelis are the first, being the fourth of these uh, occupiers, but they are the only ones that have brought in settlers and taken our land from us. The first intifada and the second intifada were basically popular uprisings. The PLO was taken by surprise in 1987 by the first uprising. They had no idea what was coming. They had no control over it. They had no purchase whatsoever, in fact. It took them the better part of a year to begin to get some kind of a grip on what was going on. It was spontaneous. It was a result of total frustration at, uh, at what was then 1987, two decades of Israeli occupation. The first intifada in 1987 uh, onwards was really about uh, mass mobilization and resistance to the occupation in, in many forms. Uh, for example, Israel shut down the school system for three years. For three years, no one could go to school or university. So Palestinians had to organize an alternative underground educational system in homes, in, uh, in, in other uh, uh, institutions, uh, which required an incredible mobilization. Uh, so it was about boycotting Israeli products which were imposed on Palestinians by the monopoly these Israeli, uh, Israelis have. Uh, it, it, so it was about uh, creating self-sufficiency in community and uh, really a grassroots. And the demonstrations was only a part of that. Uh, so that, that is the meaning of Intifada which uh, is really abiding uh, for Palestinians. The plight of Palestinian refugees has long stood as one of the most intractable obstacles in the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Confined to desperately poor refugee camps with little infrastructure and desolate living conditions, more than three generations of Palestinians have grown up with scant access to living wage work, few rights, and little hope. And one of the people that we met with who's like a U.S. Senator, 
would be his count. He's a member of the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council. He talked about one night going home to his house, and you have to walk across these things. You can't, you know, you can't drive across. You have to walk if you're Palestinian. So he arrived at the checkpoint to go home, and this young 18-year-old Israeli soldier sort of was like, why are you going? What are you doing? And made him strip naked. Why? Because he could. So then you can imagine that if you live in a place where every day you have to interact with soldiers who can force you to strip, or your mother, or your grandmother, that then you don't go. I mean, in some ways, you have to make that choice about how to live <laughs> with some sense of dignity. In the wake of the Gulf War, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker succeeded in bringing Israel and delegations representing the major Arab regimes to a peace conference for the first time. But Palestinian representation at the Madrid Peace Conference was restricted within a Jordanian-Palestine delegation, and Palestinian delegates were not allowed to discuss substantial issues of concern to their people. In early 1993, the Israelis and the Palestinians opened back channels in Oslo, which ultimately resulted in the Oslo Accords. A ceasefire was declared, and the Palestinian Authority was created. The agreement allowed Palestinians limited home rule in a restricted segment of the occupied territories, while much of the West Bank and Gaza remained in Israeli hands. Well, the Clinton proposal essentially uh, is uh, a, a concept which ignores completely history and law. On the legal front, it, uh, it calls for the uh, negation, the annulment of fundamental human rights of the Palestinian people, particularly the rights of refugees. Uh, on the uh, historical front, it says, look, let's just freeze things where they are. What's Palestinian is Palestinian, what's Jewish will be Jewish, without regard for how that situation came to be about. Uh, in other words, what Israel has taken by force, particularly in the past 33 years of the occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, it will simply get to keep. That's particularly true in and around Jerusalem. So it's a formula in which Israel fundamentally gets recognition for conquests which were declared illegal by the United Nations Security Council uh, and which most of the international community considers illegal, Israel will get to keep them. While many Palestinians viewed the Oslo Accords as an opening for greater political and economic autonomy and development, the agreement dodged many of the thorniest problems. From the right of return for refugees, to Palestinian autonomy over Israeli-controlled lands for later resolution. And despite Israeli pledges to discontinue settlement building, expansion continued unabated, further dividing and isolating the West Bank and Gaza. Adding further fuel to the fire, human rights activists charged that Israeli political repression of Palestinians continued. At the same time that most Palestinians remained mired in poverty, reaping none of the economic benefits of the Oslo Accord had promised. Many times they would stop some cars and arrest our students. Uh, before the Intifada, 250 of our students were arrested for simple reasons, for political reasons, where they were all accused of being part or members of political party, whether it's Islamic, whether it's Fatah, whether it's PFLP, and that, that is their accusation. Some of them are put under administrative arrest for six months, renewable for another six months, not being taken to court because no accusations according to Israeli law, but it allows them, the emergency law, allows them to put somebody under prison, administrative arrest they call it, and it could be renewed for years. Others were accused of being active members of political parties. Well, what I saw reminded me a lot of what I've read about apartheid. I saw two societies that are sharply polarized. One society that is relatively quite privileged, 
wealthy and secure in another society which is essentially a fourth world society living under warlike conditions and in a state of siege which has been imposed upon it. But now this huge expansion has only really happened over the past 10, 15 years of settlements that there were, there were there before but you know only a few thousand people. But now you have settlements that are, are pushing up to 100,000 people in a settlement. You know and they, they keep growing and growing because they're cheap housing, Israeli government subsidizing it, young families can move there. So you have these settlements being built and they're on Palestinians have felt they've had their land taken already. A lot of them are refugees fleeing their villages that are now part of Israel. And now then on this land what they a lot of them have been pushed to and some of them it's their native land, they see Israelis moving in on land and, and slowly taking more and more land. Hebron is a city that's in the West Bank. It formerly was Palestinian land. In 1967, Israel expanded its boundaries. It continues to hold land illegally that it seized in that war in 1967. Hebron is an area that was Palestinian. Uh, and there is now an outpost, a settlement, of literally only 400 Jews who were encouraged to settle in Hebron by the Israeli state. Settlers are given subsidies, subsidies, subsidies which, by the way, are paid for with U.S. tax dollars. The U.S. is supplying Israel not only with military assistance, but with billions of dollars in economic aid, which is used to enable it to subsidize the settlements uh, and the expansion of settlements, which has been going on throughout the Oslo peace process. Even as Israel's speaking of peace, they're building on Palestinian land, which gets at some of the contradictions with, with the Oslo Accords and why I think that they were so flawed. But in Hebron, you literally have 400 Jews living alongside 140,000 Palestinians. But because of the security uh, and the lack of equality between those 400 Jews and the 140,000 Palestinians, the 140,000 Palestinians' lives are dominated by the security apparatus that is there to protect that settlement. So that people's movement, people's uh, economic lives, people's social lives are routinely subject to the dictates of the Israeli military, including curfews, including um, uh, uh, blockages of roads, including uh, security checkpoints that are at certain points unpassable or that require hours to pass through. Now, with the recent clashes that have been going on, the Israelis have systematically started closing off roads. First major roads between major towns like Ramallah and Nablus, for example, and uh, this has been a second level of closure. And then uh, smaller roads that go th between villages and towns. And so, in essence, we have become uh, uh, smaller and, s and smaller areas of movement in which you can move. Prior, maybe you could have driven for about half an hour without being stopped. Now you can drive about 10 minutes without being stopped in any direction. And so that's the type of closures. Now they have, in addition to these permanent closures, where they bring these major um, cinder blocks, I think they're called, and they close off the road, and there's no way that you're going to be able to move. Roads are crucial to economic and social life in Palestine. Yet in the last eight years, Palestinians have found their basic mobility increasingly constrained by Israeli control of access roads through the occupied territories. Medical supplies are not immune to inspection, and people with medical ailments are routinely refused passage or are detained by Israeli troops. Water is a precious commodity in the dry lands of Gaza and the West Bank, and Palestinian access to water remains controlled by the Israeli army. Water resources in Gaza are shunted to settlements whose residents have large and thirsty lawns and swimming pools, leaving little for the Palestinians. But the source of water, Israel actually, the settlements siphon off the water that goes to the Palestinian areas. So there's, it's already in shortage. So most of the um, Palestinians have these water tanks up on their roofs and that's where the water collects and that's the source of water. And those tanks get, I think, filled from the main water supply maybe once a day and maybe not. Well, the helicopters, they, they blew out all the tank, the water tanks. 
So again, what you understand in that is that this isn't about somebody is firing on the settlers, which of course you see those roads, only the settlers go on those roads. So some Palestinians go down with rifles and shoot people. I mean, I'm not condoning that. But what you understand is it's a Palestinian neighborhood. So part of it is to try and annihilate Palestinians. And then when you understand that the water tanks are being fired out, what you understand is this is a way to try and remove Palestinians, make life unlivable for people. While Israel has encouraged its Jewish citizens, including many new residents from Russia and Eastern Europe, to take up residence in the new settlements by offering generous housing subsidies and reduced rents, many new settlers, particularly those from the United States, take up new lives in the settlements out of xenophobic conviction that they are mission-bound to take Arab-occupied land for the Jewish people. A Jewish settler from Brooklyn, just three months in Palestine, explained Israeli efforts to remove Palestinians from the West Bank in this way. God gave this land to Israel. All those communities that we build in Judea, Samaria, Gaza district, the Golan Heights, they are not uh, obstacle to peace, they are obstacle to war. So it's a formula which, uh, in which Israel uh, fundamentally gets recognition for conquests which were de declared illegal by the United Nations Security Council uh, and which most of the international community considers illegal. Israel will get to keep them. Palestinians whose rights have been recognized by the international community uh, will not get their rights. What they will get instead is a, something called a Palestinian state, but which will in fact be a, a truncated bantistan. That, that's the word Palestinians are using. And it refers to the uh, so-called homelands, which the apartheid government of South Africa set up in the 1970s as a response to criticism of apartheid. What they said was, look, uh, if you don't want to live under white majority rule, we'll give you your independence. So we will create these little homelands in the desert where you can uh, administer your own poverty, basically. So you see in striking just juxtaposition, wealth and tremendous poverty, uh, abundance and tremendous de deprivation, so that you can go from one minute to being in an area which is Israel, or which is controlled by the Israelis, including land that used to belong to the Palestinians, and then within 100 yards you're in another territory, which is Palestinian territory nominally, but in some areas Israel still maintains overall control over that area, and you see people living in refugee camps, people living in hovels, people without adequate electricity or water people experiencing mass unemployment as a result of a state of siege which has been imposed upon them, and people not able to move freely. Many human rights activists who work to oppose apartheid in South Africa have traveled to the West Bank and Gaza to gather first-hand experience of the occupation. What they have seen has shocked them. And so that was our first image was of destruction. And we met with a family there um, who had been displaced who were living in this tent, uh, staying at night with some other families, but trying to kind of say, no, this was where our home was. And then it's like you're into the history within seconds, because this was a family who were displaced from their original home in 1948. In September of 2000, Ariel Sharon, accompanied by 1,000 armed guards, visited the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the third holiest site to Muslims. With negotiations over the status of Jerusalem and other Palestinian concerns at a particularly tense stage, Saron's visit on the eve of Israeli elections was widely viewed as a naked act of provocation, particularly in light of his call for permanent Israeli annexation of East Jerusalem. Palestinians massed in large demonstrations in Jerusalem and six unarmed protesters were killed. Protests almost immediately spread throughout the West Bank and Gaza, and within Israel itself. 
While tensions in the region had clearly been escalating for some time, the West seemed shocked by the outbreak of violence, the worst that had rocked Israel since its inception. And at the end of September, when this uprising occurred, when uh, Sharon visited the Temple Mount, and thousands, or like maybe it was hundreds, I think thousands of Palestinians just erupted in anger. Uh, and Israel responded with an incredibly high level of repression, killing people, and, and in fact has not stopped killing people, Palestinians on almost a daily basis since the end of September. I think I was able to, to look at it less of, what's wrong with those people? Why don't they stop doing all this violence? To say, why would so many people be so upset that they would literally take their lives in their own hands, facing guns with rocks, to express their anger, there's something else going on. What I came to understand is that the response of the uprising, or even the response of rock throwing, um, is a response to the violence of occupation. And that's a violence that we in the United States never get to see. You know, we get to see a little bit of uh, the violence of, you know, kids throwing rocks, or we hear about a Jewish settler who's killed, and we're starting to hear more and more about Palestinians who've been killed. Um, but you have this impression that it's like there's a kind of back and forthness about it. Um, whereas what's clear from talking to people is that, um, you know, you can't talk about a ceasefire, for instance. If the Palestinians would just stop their violence, we'll stop our violence. It's like, well, there will never be an end to rock throwing or a response until the end of occupation. You know, I live in, in Beit Hanina, very close, actually, just across the street from a major Israeli settlement. Immediately after the Intifada erupted on September 28th and thereafter, and particularly during the first week, uh, uh, settlers used to raid all the Beit Hanina and Jerusalem areas between the hours of 9 in the evening till uh, uh, the wee hours of the morning, and surprisingly, under support and protection of the Israeli security and police forces. And uh, all the frustration uh, will affect your, your whole life. It's not only the hours that's being spent, but again, the humiliation. You know, when I travel with my children, you know, my, my, my parents-in-law live in Ramallah. It's a whole suffering, you know, and they see the humiliation. A full year after the beginning of the Al-Aqsa Intifada, life in Palestine remains extremely difficult. Roads are blocked, schools are closed, curfews are pervasive, and water lying under the West Bank is siphoned off and sold back to the Palestinians at exorbitant rates. The economy in the territories is in shambles, health care is gravely restricted, and employment and poverty are at record levels. Travel to a hospital can be a life-threatening experience. Houses continue to be bulldozed and blown up. And most of the world watches in horror as Israel deploys U.S.-made weapons to attack Palestinian targets and maim and kill many Palestinian civilians. But despite worldwide opposition, the occupation continues and Israel continues to defend settlements that house some of the region's most extreme religious elements. Every Israeli prime minister has, has openly supported settlements for this reason. So it's as if, you know, uh, I come into your house and I, I, I seize half of it. And uh, you go to a, a judge and the judge says, well, all right, what, what, what uh, remains yours you can keep and, and what uh, he took he can keep. And uh, that's fair because you've each got half and simply ignoring the fact of, of, of how I came to be in possession of that. But the rate of Palestinian civilian casualties in the last year and the pitch brutality of Israel's response to the Infatada have induced even U.S. news outlets, historically uncritical of Israel, to reassess some of their basic assumptions. Within hours of the September 11th attacks in the U.S., the Israeli military used the plane crashes as a pretext to set up repression and violence in the occupied territories. But in the political fallout in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the Palestinian struggle for self-determination has come to stand once again in the locus of conflict far beyond the borders of historic Palestine.
popular Arab opposition to Israeli policy in Palestine serves as a serious obstacle to U.S. goals in the region. And voices in both the West and East are increasingly calling on the United States to re-examine its support for Israeli occupation. And while the pundits debate and national leaders push their agendas, the Palestinian resistance continues, a testament to a dispossessed people's unremitting quest for dignity.